This is an idea I've had floating around in the back of my head for quite a while now, and it's due to the number of pieces I received in my inbox in response to my recent Advice for Beginning Composers video that really made me decide to take the plunge and start up a composition masterclass series on this channel. I'm perfectly happy to respond and give my critiques and pieces of advice to anyone who sends in a piece or a snippet of a piece to my inbox, but I figured that it would be more beneficial for all of the other aspiring composers who are subscribed to me if I turned these into videos in their own right so everyone can get something out of it, not just those who submitted things. And of course, I can't do this for everyone who submitted things, and I want to make sure it's okay by the people who are submitting things to turn them into videos, so I'm not going to guarantee that I'm going to do this all that often, but I figure if there's something interesting to talk about, I can do that. Today we're looking at two pieces by YouTuber Caters Carrots. First, a nocturne in B-flat, so let's take a listen. Right off the bat, there's a sense of incredible regularity to the left-hand part. In part, this is due to this being a MIDI rendering, so it's precise and exact in ways that no human performer can or should be. There's nothing wrong with the steady left-hand part in a nocturne. That's idiomatic for a nocturne. If we look at the quintessential Chopin example, Opus 9, number 2, in E-flat, we see the exact same rhythm in the left hand. The difference is that Chopin expands the range outwards. What you're hearing in Chopin is really three voices. There's the bel canto inspired melody in the right hand, there's the low bass line, and the offbeat chords which fill in the middle register. There's a difference in register and texture here that I'm not seeing in the B-flat nocturne. It's just arpeggiated chords. The space between the lowest and highest note in the B-flat nocturne is never more than a sixth. The first beat of Chopin's E-flat example alone spans two octaves and a sixth. Another major thing that I'm noticing is a difference in harmonic rhythm, that is, how often chords change. Going to Chopin as a guide once again, he rarely stays on a single sonority for very long. E-flat major moves to an altered fourth over the E-flat pedal, and then he passes through a 1-7 chord in third inversion, which isn't so much a 3rd inversion 7th chord so much as the D acting as a passing tone down to C. Now if we end up on C, we expect C minor, but he doesn't go to this, he goes to a secondary dominant. This is 5-7 of 2, and we don't even get to 2 until the final beat of measure 2. We're eased into it through another altered chord on beat 3. This isn't going to be a full harmonic analysis of the Chopin Nocturne. The first system alone is enough to show the sophistication of Chopin's harmonic thinking. The B-flat nocturne here stays on 1, and the only other sonority we get in the first measure is a neighbor 6-4 on beat 4. This isn't to say that harmonic stasis doesn't have its place, but this kind of writing runs throughout the entire piece, and when you do that, I can't help but wonder if paying attention to harmonic rhythm, again, the rate of harmonic change, would significantly improve the piece. If you applied some of Chopin's thinking to this piece, you might end up with something like this. say, I'd rather not just imitate Chopin, and that's totally fine, but you've got to start somewhere, and the only way to understand what your style is, is sometimes just to copy others. Not verbatim, but to look at their techniques, and to see what they do. You don't have to write exactly like Chopin in order to learn from him. Pay attention in this piece especially to voice leading. Let's go back, and look at this altered chord. E-flat, A-flat, D, C-flat. That's kind of funky. You could call it a diminished 4 over a tonic pedal, which is probably the best thing. This works because Chopin's not using this as a functional chord at all. The A-flat and the C-flat 
are half steps above G and B flat, notes of the tonic triad, and D is the leading tone to E flat. Ignoring the E flat, each of these notes moves by half step to the tonic, a much more stable chord. This is merely a more chromatic version of the standard 4 6 4, the same neighbor 6 4 that the B flat nocturne has. Even if you mixed up and vary the left hand part, which is what we focused on up until this point, this can only go so far, because the same texture dominates throughout the piece. The MIDI rendition here lasts a little over seven minutes, and Chopin's usually takes you around four and a half. So while you can get away with a rhythmically repetitive bass, if you've got a sufficiently interesting melody, and Chopin provides us with many runs and embellishments, there's always going to be a point where it's going to lose the listener's interest. It's what my composition professor would call just marking time. So, yeah, let's just see how Chopin deals with this. He's got sections where he varies the texture not a lot, but just enough. Instead of single notes in the right hand, he's got chords spread out across both hands, he drops the low bass notes, and the harmonic rhythm is sped up significantly. Instead of changing once a beat, he's changing once per eighth note here, which makes the return to a more harmonically static left hand part in the next bar much more satisfying. He gives us just a taste of something else, paired with a small slowing down that we feel relieved when we return to a variation on something that we've already heard. The lesson here is that you don't have to keep the same thing going. Listeners have pretty good attention spans and will recognize something when it comes back later. This is especially true when it comes to form. It is how composers develop form. You have to understand how the form is going to play out in the minds of listeners. Next up is the very beginning of a scherzo in F, also by Cater's Carrots, who specifically wanted to know how to achieve a Haydn-esque feel to this piece. It's only seven measures, but there's something to be gained by looking at it, and importantly, figuring out what Haydn's sense of humor really was. But first we need to address this. It's not the worst thing in the world, it's certainly readable, but if you write this, what you're implying is an underlying rhythm of 6-8, one and a two and a, as opposed to one and two and three and. It's the same number of eighth notes, but it doesn't snap to an underlying grid of 3-4. It's two beats over the span of where you normally have three. It's easy for beginning composers to fall into the trap of thinking of 6-8 and 3-4 as essentially the same, but the underlying beat structure is different. And in West Side Story, Bernstein does this with the song America, to the point where he employs a dual time signature of 6-8 and 3-4, clearly showing that the splitting of the 6-8 notes changes from one bar to the next. And when you listen to it, you can hear a change of meter, even though the number of eighth notes in a bar does not change whatsoever. For a single bar, there's no reason to change the time signatures. You can just rewrite it so that the rhythm is intact while still snapping to the grid of the underlying 3-4. Notation is all about making your music as readable as possible to someone who otherwise doesn't know how it goes. The Haydn-esque part of this is what really intrigues me, though, because Haydn is known for being a musical jokester. There's a lot of wit in his pieces, but he wasn't really known for writing scherzos per se. He wrote over a hundred symphonies, and his symphonic third movements conform to the minuet and trio style. It's only in Beethoven that we begin to see the word scherzo consistently crop up as the replacement for what was really the last of the Baroque dances to go the way of the dodo bird. Haydn did use the word scherzo, not the least of which is in his string quartets, collectively known as Gli Scherzi, which is the plural. He did this more in his chamber music, and his wit wasn't confined to just three, four middle movements. Haydn fools us by setting us up with expectations and then radically altering the fulfillment of those expectations. There are subtle ways he does this, such as beginning the recapitulation in the wrong key, something most modern-day listeners don't really notice to his use of false endings and evaded cadences, which are funny because he's subverting the expectations that he spent the rest of the piece setting up.
I bring up Beethoven because Cater's writes, Beethoven's scherzos tend to sound serious. Even his earliest scherzos tend to be like that with lots of the minor mode. If you're familiar just with his piano music, then maybe, but I would argue otherwise. I'm a big fan of the scherzos, or minuets and trios, no matter what he wants to call them, from his first three symphonies. Combined, these have a lot of emphasized offbeats and unconventional tonal relationships. In all, they're just fun movements to listen to. Beethoven wasn't always universally angsty, and I think there's a lot to be gained from what he did, because he really inherited Haydn's sense of humor in a way that people don't usually acknowledge. You look at later scherzos of Beethoven's, and indeed they start to get darker and more angsty. In only seven measures, I can't give a lot of critiques as to how Haydn-esque it is right now, just some things to keep in mind as you go forward with writing the piece. 1. Set up expectations with the intent of subverting them. 2. Don't be afraid to emphasize offbeats or include hemiolas. 3. Put in silence where you don't expect it, or sudden shifts in mood, or things like that. And there's certainly a lot to be gained by Haydn, but don't discount Beethoven either if you want some fun scherzi. <laughs> 